President. The senator from Texas is recognized. I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be lifted. Without objection. The senator from Texas is recognized. Will senators please take their conversations from the chamber? Mr. President, uh, we have been here this week. The Senate will come to order. Senator, senator from, from Texas from, is recognized. Senator from Texas, yield for a question. I will, Mr. President. Senator from Texas, uh, I, I was just wondering if the uh, view uh, that she might have that we've been terribly overworked this week. Um, I understand that uh, we canceled our uh, Fourth of July recess in order to get back here and get to work and do the people's business. Uh, is it correct that that was the, the second vote that we have taken? One was being instruction of the sergeant arms, and this one another highly controversial uh, issue that was taken up. So uh, I guess my question to the senator from Texas, has this week been a worthwhile expenditure of the taxpayer's dollar? Well, I would respond to the distinguished senator from Arizona that um, the, um, the resolution that was just uh, passed was to go to a sense of the Senate uh, resolution, which of course has no force of law. Um, and it is indeed our second vote this week. And uh, I will say that uh, there's one thing on the minds of the people today. One thing on the minds of the people of America today, and it is what on earth the is not in order. What on earth? Senator is correct. The Senate will come to order. The Senate will come to order. The chair asks senators to please take conversations off the floor. Senator from Texas is recognized. Americans are saying, what on earth is Congress doing? What on earth is the president doing? What are they doing to address the looming debt crisis? And we were called back in uh, not to recess so that we could do something meaningful. Uh, when uh, I saw the senator uh, from Arizona on the floor, uh, he was ready to talk about uh, our international situation and the commitments that we are making. Uh, certainly, uh, many people said, no, wait a minute, we've got a debt crisis and we can't wait till August 2nd to fulfill it. Uh, so I would just uh, respond to the senator from Arizona and say, um, when does the when do the American people get the answer that they deserve, which is Congress and the President are working together and we are being productive and we have a budget resolution on the floor and we're debating it and we're talking about our differences on taxes and spending. You know, I don't think we can tax our way out of a recession. I don't think we can tax our way uh, out of the budget deficits. I would just ask the senator from Arizona uh, if he thinks that uh, we can make meaningful progress staying in session and uh, debating, and if in fact that might be an option in the future. I see, the distinguished, I see the distinguished majority leader waiting, so I, I will make my comments brief. I know that his agenda is very busy. I would just say that. Uh, I, to my friend from Texas, and I understand the, a lot of the inner mechanisms and hidden workings that's going on behind the scenes, but when I go back and tell my constituents that we were canceled a week of recess and we had two votes, one to instruct the Sergeant Arms and the other on a sense of Senate resolution, um, I would have liked to have taken up other business that was uh, rejected by members on this side because they wanted to focus on the deficit. But if we're focusing on that, maybe we should have taken up some issues that directly affect the deficit, such as ethanol subsidies, such as some of the other um, tax breaks and loopholes and other issues that surround uh, the whole bankruptcy of this country. So I, I see the majority leader is, is there waiting, so I will yield uh, to my friend from Texas. Uh, Mr. President, I would just ask unanimous consent that following the majority leader, I regain the floor. Majority leader is recognized. And, and the senator from Texas will have the floor. I, I, just a brief comment. Uh, 
I've known my friend, the senior senator from Arizona, since 1982, when we were both elected to Congress. And his record of public service speaks for itself. But I would say to him and to everyone within the sound of my voice, we didn't vote on Libya, this important resolution that had been worked on so hard by the distinguished senator from Arizona and the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee because I was told we wouldn't get any votes from the Republicans because they wanted to focus on the deficit. My friend also recognizes, as he said, that there's work going on beyond, behind the scenes, and that's true. There's been a lot of work this week that took place as a result of our being here that would not have taken place but for the fact that we're in session. Now, we know that a lot of the work we accomplish here is not with votes. And one reason we're not having a lot of votes uh, in recent months is because we can't get things on the floor. We have, we're stopped from my Republican friends. There's meetings going on with the White House and the Speaker, multitude of meetings there. Uh, meetings going on between members of the Senate and Democrats and Republicans in the House of Representatives. So um, I would say to everyone here, it's good we were in session this week. I haven't heard a single person who is not in Congress complain about our being here. It's important we're here. And as a result of that, we've been able to move down the road much further on this problems we have with the debt than we would have had we not been in session, because there's all kinds of meetings going on around town dealing with how we do this. We had a meeting right behind us today, starting at 9 o'clock, where we had head of the Chamber of Commerce in. We had people from Moody's Financial Services, and they were there to tell us what they're doing to focus on Republicans being able to help us get through this problem dealing with the debt. We have to do something about the staggering debt that faces us. And what this resolution that we voted on earlier today is all about is making sure that there's equal sacrifice in our country. That is, there, we know that we're going to have to make some cuts. But we also recognize that we need to do something about equalized revenue. And that's what's going on. And while what we do here in the Senate every week isn't like solving a math problem, there's no perfection. That's the way the Founding Fathers set up this great government of ours. And so we're going to continue to work in the next four weeks of this work period to solve some of the nation's problems. Number one on the list is doing something about our staggering debt. Mr. President. Senator from Texas is recognized. Mr. President, um, I appreciate what the majority leader has said. There is a lot going on, and uh, there is the beginning, perhaps, of uh, a coming together, hopefully, with the President and the uh, leadership of the House uh, and the Senate, and I just hope that we can establish uh, why it is that there is such a divide on uh, how we accomplish the issue of raising the debt ceiling with real reforms that will assure that we will not have to raise the debt ceiling again that we will cut deficits so that the debt will also be cut in this country. We cannot sustain the level of debt that we have now. It is the highest that we have ever had in the history of this country. And Mr. President, let's face it, we have two basic problems here. We have this looming $14 trillion debt that is about to hit the ceiling, and we have to raise the ceiling now, it would be irresponsible to do that without significant reforms that will assure that we're not going to hit it again. But the second problem is we have 9.1% unemployment. So it's not like we're in a vacuum here and we can just start taxing our small businesses when small business has already had the looming hit of the health care plan that was passed that is going to cost every business in this country significant increases in their cost of doing business. So when people are out there saying, well, why is unemployment still so high? Why is hiring lagging? I think it is because Businesses are trying to prepare for this big hit that they're going to get 
in 2014 when the Obama health care plan uh, takes full effect and they're trying to figure out are they going to pay more for insurance or are they going to take the fine and pay fines for every employee who doesn't have insurance which is going to cause chaos in this country. So they're trying to decide. On top of that, people on the other side of the aisle in Washington, D.C. keep talking about increasing taxes, and the president keeps talking about increasing taxes. And so no wonder our employers are not saying, oh, yes, let's just open the floodgates and bring people back to work, because they don't know what to expect. We must generate economic growth, not stifle it. We need businesses to feel confident in the future that they're going to be able to make a profit on top of all the added costs of new taxes and a health care reform that is going to hit business the hardest. So we don't have a tax problem in this country. We're not being tax too little. This government is spending too much. That's the problem we're facing right now. That's why we have a $14 trillion debt. We have a $1.6 trillion shortfall between spending and revenue. So, you know, I'm reminded of what Ronald Reagan once said. We don't have a trillion dollar debt because we haven't taxed enough, we have a trillion dollar debt because we spend too much. Let's look at the spending side of the equation. We can't continue business as usual in Washington and fix this problem. When President Obama was sworn into office, the national debt was $10.6 trillion. It was too much then. I think we all agree. Now it's $14.3 trillion. We are weeks away from officially hitting that $14.3 trillion debt ceiling. Now, we have had a monumental addition to the unprecedented number of spending dollars that was the stimulus that passed in February of 2009. Today, the President's Council of Economic Advisors has, has said that 2.4 million jobs were created at a cost of $666 billion. That's about three quarters of the stimulus. That is a cost to taxpayers of $278,000 per job. Now, Mr. President, that's just not reasonable. This is the kind of spending that we cannot continue in this country. You know, I think they say they want to increase taxes, and I hear the President say we must increase taxes on the oil companies, we'll increase taxes on corporate jets. Well, you know, I think if we are fair and across the board and we tax oil companies like we tax every business, sure. I think let's, let's even the playing field. If we're going to take away the, uh, the business deductions that every business gets in this country, then sure, let's take it from every business, including oil. But it's not going to help the deficit because it's not enough to help the deficit. They say they want to increase taxes in order to reduce the deficit. But what they really want is to increase taxes to permanently increase spending so that the big government that we have seen grow in the last two years, two and a half years, will be permanent. That's why they want to increase taxes. So, Mr. President, I say there's a, there's a way to fix this. First of all, we could pass a balanced budget amendment. A balanced budget amendment to the U.S. Constitution would put us on a budget that we would have to meet like most states in this nation and every business and every family. We would set the limits. 
I believe the appropriate limit would be that total federal expenditures would be limited to 18 percent of the gross domestic product. Then Congress would also have to have caps on spending, about same, 18 percent of gross domestic product. Now this would be a spending reform that we could adopt that I believe the states would also agree to ratify that would give us a trajectory that would eliminate this deficit and the debt in this country and we would be on a fiscally responsible path. Second, if we're going to do this, we've got to look at entitlements. Now that's the reality. That is the reality. We have a nearly bankrupt entitlement system that is ongoing regardless of what the revenue coming in is. The debt limit and the ongoing deficit reduction negotiations need to put entitlement reform on the table. Until yesterday, they had refused to do it. But now it seems that perhaps some entitlement reform might be on the table. For instance, one that I have introduced a bill to correct is the Social Security system. Social Security will account for one-fifth of all federal spending this year, one-fifth. The time for reform is now, and we can do it in a reasonable way. The amount of Social Security benefits being paid out exceeds the revenue that Social Security payroll is collecting and we're starting to draw down on the Social Security reserves. When the reserves run out in 2036, Social Security will only be able to pay out 70% of the benefits to current and future retirees. That is the law today. It would force a 23% cut in benefits. That's the law today. The Social Security Board of Trustees reported earlier this year that one way to shore up Social Security's assets is to immediately and permanently increase the combined payroll tax on employees and employers from 12.4 to 14.5 percent. In other words, increase payroll taxes by one-sixth during our jobless economic non-recovery. I don't think that's really feasible. The trustees also noted that the shortfall could be eliminated by an immediate and permanent 13.8% cut in core benefits that retirees are getting right now. An immediate $150 per month cut in every Social Security benefit check right now. That was what the Social Security trustees suggested was a possibility. Now, that is something I think we would unanimously in this United States Senate reject. No one is going to cut benefits $150 right now per month. Nobody. Nobody would do it. So, if we are going to address this, I have proposed a plan. Senator Kyle and I introduced Senate Bill 1213, the Defend and Save Social Security Act. First, everyone knows we're living longer than when the Social Security Act passed. We have a higher quality of life. People want to work longer in most areas. So why not gradually raise the retirement age without impacting those who are about to retire? Under my bill, anyone who is 58 years of age or older will see no change. For everyone else, starting in 2016, the normal and early retirement age would increase by three months a year. So the normal retirement age would reach 67 by 2019, 68 by 2023, and 69 at 2027. And it stops there. Early retirement would be gradually, three months a year, increased to 63 by 2019 and 64 by 2023, and it would stop. 
Secondly, currently Social Security recipients receive an annual cost of living adjustment, a COLA. Under my plan, the COLA would be computed as it is in current law, reduced 1%. So, the average rate of inflation in COLA has been 2.2% excuse me, every year of an increase. So if we have a 2.2% rate of inflation COLA, it would be a 1.2% increase in Social Security benefits. So what I'm saying is that a 1% decrease in the COLA is just a 1% increase in the a 1% decrease in the increase so that you would have the gradual raising of the age that would be much more in line with our actuarial table and the reality today where people are living much longer and you would also have a slight decrease in the increase in Social Security benefits according to inflation. If we have rampant inflation then you would have the COLA just a 1% less. So if it's 2.2% inflation, then you would get a 1.2% COLA. Doing that saves the Social Security system and it closes the 75-year gap. It doesn't raise taxes on anyone and it doesn't cut a core benefit for anyone. That is the way we could fix Social Security right now. And what would that do for our deficit? Here's what it would do. It would achieve a $416 billion reduction over the next 10 years of our deficit and a $7.2 trillion savings by 2085. So that means we're on the track. That means in 75 years, Social Security will be solid and secure without a tax increase on anyone and without a cut in core benefits to anyone and no one who is 58 years of age or older will have any adjustment whatsoever. So, in the age whatsoever. So, Mr. President, we have a chance to do some things. Now, I've, I've gone out and said, here's a proposal. My colleague, Senator Corker, has proposed a limit, a cap on spending that is a reasonable limit. Uh, other colleagues, Senator Lee, Senator Paul, uh, have suggested, and Senator Toomey, have suggested other ways to cut spending across the board, just a level goal. They're not cutting specific things, but they're cutting the discretionary spending at reasonable levels. Many Republicans are offering ways to cut back on spending. My colleague Senator Cornyn from Texas has put forward a cap on spending and a balanced budget amendment. There are proposals out there that are responsible ways to deal with this deficit that include entitlements and discretionary spending both. It is time, Mr. President, for the President of the United States to sit down at the table and understand that tax increases for kind of a photo op uh, PR are not going to fill the void. The public relations of cutting back on corporate jet benefits, whatever they are. I don't know what they are, don't have one, but you know, I think we'd probably all agree. If you can afford a corporate jet or a private jet, you know, fine. Whatever the president wants to do, we'll do it. And it will do nothing to help the deficit. So why don't we do the meaningful things, which is make meaningful cuts in discretionary spending. Let's attack what everybody knows is the case, and that is Social Security is going bankrupt as we speak. And if Congress and the President will speak responsibly about it, we can 
put that on a glide path that is within the reasonable actuarial table estimate so that people will work longer, very gradually increase starting in 2016, ending in 2027 at 69. That's gradual. So, Mr. President, we can't procrastinate. We can't wait. We can't hope the crisis will pass. And we cannot delay the inevitable. This is the United States Senate. We were elected to make the tough choices. It is time for us to do it. Thank you, Mr. President. And I yield the floor. Mr. President, Senator from Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today to discuss the Senate's uh, upcoming trade agenda and its impact on Pennsylvania workers and Pennsylvania jobs. Like so many of our states, Pennsylvania has always played a critically important role in America's manufacturing and commercial heritage. The coal and waterways of our state help make the Commonwealth um, legendary for steelmaking and help turn the United States into an industrial powerhouse. During its heyday, 60% of the domestic steel production in the United States came from Pennsylvania. During World War II, almost one-third of the nation's steel came from Pennsylvania, which was a full 20 percent of global production at the time. The then Pennsylvania uh, governor, Arthur James, put it this way, Pennsylvania was truly the arsenal of democracy and the arsenal of America. Given its dominance in the steel industry, it's no surprise that the Commonwealth was sixth in the nation in total war production during the Second World War, leading in shipbuilding and, and munitions production. More money was spent to expand production capacity in Pennsylvania than in any other state during the war. And we know at the time that it didn't stop there. It didn't stop at the end of the war. After, after the war was over, these manufacturing facilities were used to make American products and fuel the growth of a thriving middle class. Today, so many of these plants have gone away, due in part to our failed trade policies. Over the last 30 years, we've seen trade deficits soar, currency manipulation go unchecked, lavish subsidies by foreign governments go ignored, and exploitation of workers, exploitation of workers in other countries overlooked. That's why I'm very concerned that today the Finance Committee is moving forward with the pending agreements with South, South Korea, Colombia, uh, and Panama. For the last several weeks, the presiding officer, Senator Brown, and I have persistently asked the tough, critical questions about the impact of these agreements before they're considered. A review of the impact of past trade agreements offers very little comfort. In 1994, Congress passed the North American Free Trade Agreement, creating the world's largest free trade zone. We know it as NAFTA. And since NAFTA's passage, U.S. trade policies have steadily chipped away at Pennsylvania's manufacturing base, it is a critical sector for our state and so many others. According to a recent study, and the chart on my left depicts it, by the Pennsylvania Industrial Resource Centers from 1997 to 2010, just 13 years, manufacturing went from 16.4 percent of our state's uh, gross state product to 12.1 percent, a remarkable drop in just 13 years. And what does that mean for the total number of jobs? In total, Pennsylvania lost nearly 300,000 manufacturing jobs. And you can see it from the chart. Starting in 1997, the drop to 12.1 in just those 13 years. 300,000 jobs in 13 years. Despite these alarming numbers and statistics, advocates for, for the trade deals, including the pending agreement with South Korea, promise significant economic benefits from exploding export potential, potential to direct job creation. Proponents argue, they argue, a significant net positive from these agreements every time they're considered. 
In reality, instead of creating opportunities for Pennsylvania, our trade policies did little more than offshore good-paying jobs while giving our trading partners unlimited access to our markets. So we must take the time now to ask the tough questions. Specifically, as a senator from Pennsylvania, I must ask three basic questions about any trade deal. Number one, will the agreement protect current Pennsylvania jobs and create new jobs in Pennsylvania and across America? Number two, will the agreement help create a level playing field for American businesses and workers? And third, does the agreement provide new opportunities for American manufacturers to export? Today I'll focus on the South Korea uh, trade agreement in the context of each question. First, will the agreement protect and create jobs in Pennsylvania and across the nation? In these uncertain times, job creation must be our top priority. In Pennsylvania, the manufacturing sector is critical. Manufacturing remains the Commonwealth's largest source of good-paying jobs with chemical primary metal products, fabricated metal products, food products, and machinery making up the top five manufacturing sectors supporting uh, Pennsylvania families. These benefits extend beyond individual manufacturing businesses in our state. In fact, the economic benefits of a strong manufacturing sector experienced throughout Pennsylvania's economy. According to research commissioned by the Pennsylvania Industrial Resource Centers, every one dollar increase in demand for products manufactured in our state leads to an increase in gross value of two dollars and fifty two cents across all industries. So one buck uh, in activity can lead to two fifty two in, in, in value. The manufacturing jobs that are created uh, support middle-income families and the, the, the creation of those jobs and the support they provided to those families in 2008 meant the following. The average annual compensation of a worker in the manufacturing sector was over $65,000. The average pay for the rest of the workforce was $10,000 less. Each good paying job in this country allows for more money to flow back into the economy. Given the importance of manufacturing jobs in Pennsylvania, we must ask ourselves, will the Korea trade agreement create jobs, especially in the manufacturing sector? I believe it will not create a substantial number of new jobs in this critical sector. Looking back over the last 20 years, trade-related job expansion has been an unfulfilled promise for Pennsylvania and the nation. We need look no further than NAFTA. In 1993, when the agreement was signed, NAFTA promised to deliver hundreds of thousands of jobs across the United States. Leading economists at the time projected NAFTA would bring 170,000 new jobs in the near term alone. These gains were not realized. Instead, since NAFTA was signed into law through 2002, uh, 525,094 workers were certified as displaced under NAFTA according to the Department of Labor. And I'm sure that number has grown since that 2002 uh, data point. Furthermore, when NAFTA was negotiated, leaders suggested that American exports would expand greatly to meet the newfound demands of the open Mexican market with all of its new customers. The opposite has occurred. In 1993, the United States had a small trade surplus. We had a surplus with Mexico. According to the official Census Bureau statistics, by 2010, 17 years later, we were running a trade deficit with Mexico of $66.4 billion. So a surplus in trade with Mexico became a huge deficit. Trade with, China, uh, with Canada also saw a widening trade deficit from $10 billion in, in 1993 to $28 billion in 2010. So there, a deficit got bigger whereas in the case of Mexico, it went from surplus to a massive deficit of $66 billion with Mexico. The impact of these policies is plainly seen in employment data. Pennsylvania has seen a dramatic decline in manufacturing employment since NAFTA was implemented, losing a total of over 300,000 jobs, as I said before. With this rosy prediction for NAFTA in mind, a close look at the government's projections for 
the South Korea agreement uh, should be viewed with uh, great skepticism. With the International Trade Com while the International Trade Commission predicts our bilateral trade with Korea will improve, the total U.S. trade deficit is predicted to get larger. While the proponents of the agreement argue that U.S. exports to Korea will increase, they are neglecting to tell the whole truth. Companies will shift, uh, simply shift from exporting to creating uh, current customers in other places uh, to Korea, rather than increasing total exports. Second question I ask is, will this agreement help create a level playing field uh, after enactment? I believe that this agreement, the South Korea agreement, will fail uh, to create a level playing field for our workers and our companies. Modern trade agreements do more than cut tariffs. These agreements contain hundreds of provisions that make substantial changes to non-trade policies, and the Korea agreement is no exception. According to the group Public Citizen, these non-trade provisions limit the authority granted to elected representatives of the American people over product and food safety, financial regulations, health care and energy regulations, patent terms, and even how tax dollars can be spent by the government. The agreement allows Korea exporters, Korean exporters I should say, to take investment disputes out of courts and into unaccountable and secretive international tribunals through a process known as investor to state dispute uh, system that is similar to uh, NAFTA's. Additionally, the investment chapters are signed, that were signed prior to the current financial crisis back in 2007. These specific chapters include rules that prohibit either country from imposing firewalls between the sorts of financial services one firm may offer, may offer to limit the spread of risk, for example. Important protections put in place after the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008 could potentially be challenged under the pending agreement. Even more troubling is the issue of Korea's currency. South Korean currency manipulation remains an unaddressed problem. As we've seen in China, an intentionally weakened currency leads to a fundamentally unbalanced trade relationship and brutal conditions for U.S. companies. In a June 17th report, the Economic Policy Institute calculated that if Asian currencies were strengthened to appropriate market-determined levels, if, they had, if, if that were done, U.S. gross domestic product would increase by as much as $285.7 billion, or 1.9 percent, creating up to 2.25 million U.S. jobs. That's if, if Asian currencies were strengthened to those appropriate levels. Unfortunately, as with other NAFTA-style free trade agreements, this South Korea agreement is silent on currency. This is unacceptable because South Korea devalued their currency twice, once in 1988, once in 1998. Both interventions devalued their currency by 50 percent or more. South Korea was one of the first countries cited as a currency manipulator by the Treasury Department in 1988. South Korea continues their long history of manipulating their currency. In fact, the most recent Treasury report to Congress on international economic and exchange rate policies from May 27, 2011, noted that South Korea uh, intervened, quote, heavily, unquote, in its currency market during the financial crisis and has continued uninterrupted since. Treasury urged South Korea to, quote, adopt a greater degree of exchange rate flexibility and less intervention, unquote. Currency policy has played a central role in China's mercantilist trade policies and has cost the United States thousands and thousands of jobs. We should not be cutting tariffs we should not be cutting tariffs with a country with South Korea's heavy uh, history on currency manipulation without language to deal with uh, protecting us in a competitive uh, environment and in the devaluations that they've undertaken before. Additionally, several groups have raised the possibility that the agreement could be used to weaken U.S. trade laws. The, the free trade agreement creates a bilateral commission 
on trade laws. While our trade representative argues that this will not change any existing U.S. trade laws, this avenue could be used by advocates of weaker enforcement in the future. Finally, I turn to the last question. Does the agreement provide new opportunities for Pennsylvania manufacturers to export their goods? Like NAFTA, the benefits of the South Korea deal have been, in my judgment, overstated, <laughs> while the risks have been largely ignored. Rather than opening new, a new market for Pennsylvania farmers and manufacturers, I'm concerned that the benefits to the United States are minimal at best. There are specific reasons this deal fails to deliver for Pennsylvania exporters. First, most of the benefits are based on an overly optimistic projection for agriculture. These projections, compiled by supporters of the agreement, assume that a cut in tariffs will immediately equal a growth in market share. We know from past experience that Asian markets, including South Korea, have come up with a host of unjustified non-tariff restrictions to keep United States beef out of their country. These barriers to free trade are likely to limit export potential and are largely unaddressed in the agreement. There are troubling, I should say, other troubling clauses dealing with the beef industry. The South Korea agreement will allow American beef packagers to use Canadian or Mexican cattle and then export the packaged Mexican and or Canadian beef as, quote, American, unquote, beef. This policy, while great for beef packagers, undercuts United States ranchers. Given our difficulties in gaining a foothold in these markets, we should rely solely on U.S. cattle, uh, which we know is safe. Second, for one, one of Pennsylvania's most important sectors, dairy, the competing European Union free trade agreement with South Korea could inhibit, inhibit our ability to compete in the South Korean market. The text of the European Union agreement specifies that certain types of cheese, including mozzarella, must come from specific regions. As a result, European exporters could challenge, European exporters could challenge U.S. producers selling cheese in South Korea as, quote, mozzarella or, quote, parmesan, unquote. In this sense, the Europeans have negotiated a better agreement, giving European companies an advantage over American uh, companies. Another problem with the agreement is uh, which goods qualify for, quote, made in, in South Korea uh, designation, the sticker, so to speak, uh, and are, are allowed to therefore enter the United States duty-free. Under, uh, under the rules of the agreement in Annex 6A, 65 percent of the value of many goods including automobiles shipped duty-free to the U.S., can come from South Korea and still be considered, quote, made in South Korea. This standard is lower than the European Union agreement. The European agreement has uh, a 55 percent content standard where content can be foreign and, once again, places our companies at a comparative disadvantage in international competition, just as the, the chart depicts. 35 percent Korea plus 65 percent China would equal made in Korea. I don't think that's what the American people bargain for when they expect us to get trade policies right. In a sense, this opens a door, really a back door, for products primarily made in places like North Korea or China to enter the United States of America duty-free. That is wrong. It should be changed, and we should not vote for an agreement that has that in it. So let me conclude, Mr. President, with the three questions that uh, I started with. First, will the agreement create a substantial number of new jobs? I'm concerned that it will not. In, the pre in previous agreements like NAFTA, if there are any indication, the U.S.-Korea agreement will lead to job losses, especially in the critical manufacturing sector. Second, will the agreement help create a level playing field? It will not. The agreement fails to address critical issues like currency manipulation that have her already hurt American businesses and cost us jobs. Does the agreement provide new opportunities for American manufacturers to export? Proponents have overstated the benefits. Uh, certain industries and firms are likely to benefit, while many others will not. What is clear is that in its failure to address non-tariff barriers to trade, 
the agreement leaves American firms unprotected and on a playing field that is not level. Instead of moving ahead with a broken model, we need to focus on the bigger picture, formulating a strategy that helps American manufacturers, that leads to job creation and helps middle-income families um, help us create the jobs of the future. To make real sustained progress, Washington needs to have a plan, a strategy. We must develop and commit ourselves to a national manufacturing strategy that includes job creating trade policies as well. Recently, I convened a roundtable in Pennsylvania, leaders of several southwestern Pennsylvania companies at the Universal uh, Electric Corporation in Cannonsburg, Washington County, to listen to their ideas about how I can bring their ideas to Washington, D.C., to keep a focus on supporting manufacturing. I heard a number of common themes. First of all, we should develop a national strategy, as I mentioned, for manufacturing. Second, we should make the R&D tax credit permanent. Third, we should crack down, really crack down, on China's currency manipulation and other unfair trade policies so that Pennsylvania companies and our workers have at least a fair shot. Legislation I recently introduced gives us those tools to hold countries accountable for manipulating their currencies. Fourth, extend uh, trade adjustment assistance to help workers who have lost their jobs to overseas unfair foreign competition so they can build new skills and find new employment. Finally, invest in science, technology, engineering, and math, the so-called STEM disciplines, which we know will create uh, many jobs in the future. Manufacturing is the heart and soul of Pennsylvania and our nation's economy. Our future depends on developing policies that help our workers and our businesses compete in the global production of goods. Our workers and our businesses can outcompete anyone in the world, any country in the world. We just need to give them a fair shot. We need to give them a strategy, and these agreements don't do that. Mr. President, I would yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I observe that uh, you have the misfortune of seemingly being in the chair whenever I end up coming down speaking lately, but uh, I appreciate your patience. Mr. President, today congressional leaders are meeting with the President of the United States to discuss what can be done to reduce the nation's out-of-control deficit, to deal with our unsustainable debt, and to get America back to work and help grow our economy. I want to congratulate the President for uh, convening this meeting, which will be probably one of the last chances we will have uh, to deal with this deadline of August the 2nd uh, to deal with the debt limit, where we've maxed out our nation's credit card while spending 43 cents out of every dollar that um, the federal government spends today is borrowed money, making that deficit worse, not better, making the deficit the debt worse and not better. This is the chance to kick the habit of out-of-control spending here in Washington. I appreciate the fact the President has moved from his initial position when he advocated that Congress simply raise the debt limit without putting Washington and Congress on a spending diet. I appreciate the fact he has moved in his position and read today in the uh, in the daily newspapers that he is putting a lot of things, including Social Security reform, on the table, together with other, other entitlements. I hope this represents a change of position, a change of attitude, and uh, that the President and our negotiators will seize this opportunity to do the kind of grand bargain that will put America back onto a more solid fiscal path where every child born into the world in the United States today, while being uh, one of the luckiest uh, people in the world, being born in the United States of America, but at the same time being burdened, every child born today will be burdened with $46,000 in their share of the national debt. And that's simply wrong, and we all know it. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of discussion about the White House and some of our Democratic colleagues wanting to raise taxes as part of this grand bargain. Indeed, uh, I think that's the, the uh, notion behind this sense of the Senate resolution 
that the majority leader has introduced, uh, which is targeted at millionaires and billionaires. And the sense of the Senate resolution that the majority leader wants us to vote on is that it is the sense of the Senate that any agreement to reduce the budget deficit should require that those earning $1 million or more per year make a more meaningful contribution to deficit reduction. Unfortunately, this is not real legislation. This won't change anything. This is a sense of the Senate. This is a resolution, which I think is a missed opportunity to actually deal with the issue rather than just pretend like we're treating it seriously. But when the, when the White House proposes that working families and small businesses, among others, suffer a $400 billion tax increase over the next 10 years, it strikes me that in one sense this is like a diet where you say, well, I'm going to give up dessert. I'm not going to eat dessert. But then you binge on the buffet. In other words, it's not real. It's not going to work. To put this in perspective, the federal government is currently borrowing $4 billion every day this year. So actually raising taxes in this amount, while this only amounts to uh, 10 days of what Washington spends, raising taxes by $400 billion over 10 years. And while we can see that that is not a won't make a serious dent in the deficit and the debt, they are very serious job-killing proposals. It strikes me as just common sense to say if you want more jobs, that you make it easier to create jobs. If you, want to make, if you want less jobs, you make it harder to create jobs by raising taxes, by uh, excessive regulation, and other obstacles to job creation. The irony is that uh, our friends on the other side who propose tax increases as part of this grand bargain, I'm not confident they actually want to use that increased revenue to pay down the deficit and the debt. To the contrary, I fear what they want to do is continue spending at the current levels. So it's really kind of a shell game, saying we're going to cut $2 trillion, but we're going to raise taxes by $2 trillion. What does that mean? Unless those that $2 trillion in additional revenue is used to pay down the debt, it means it's a wash. And government and Washington continues business as usual. Well, I don't think the American people want us to continue doing business as usual. I think they want us to listen to them and to mend our ways. But let me just give you a uh, context for what, how non-serious some of the proposals coming, including out of the President of the United States. All of a sudden, he, uh, he focused last week on this um, depreciation schedule for corporate jets. Now, depreciation is a normal part of the tax code, says if you use something in a business, you can basically write it, write it down over time. And uh, it won't surprise you to find that uh, if you did that, if you did what the President said, eliminate depreciation of corporate jets, it would generate about $3 billion in revenue to the Federal Treasury over 10 years. $3 billion over 10 years. But just to get a sense of what a minuscule contribution that would make to solving the problem, consider what our annual deficit is. This is in one year. This is what 1.7, excuse me, $1.5 trillion looks like. It's got 12 zeros, 1, 5, 12, 11 zeros after the 5. That's an annual deficit. The President says to solve this annual deficit, you need to raise $3 billion in additional revenue from corporate jet owners. Obviously, it's a drop in the bucket. But it's even worse when you look at the, at the debt. The deficit, of course, is what the difference between what Congress brings in, what the federal government brings in, and what it spends. Right now, it's spending about $1.5 trillion more each year that it brings in in revenue. That's the deficit. But the accumulation, accumulation of those deficits represents the debt. This is how much, our, how much red ink that our federal government is spending or where we find ourselves. And that's $14 trillion. 
This is the number that the president wants us to raise, $14 trillion, wants us to raise, that's like the max on your credit card. And if you're spending too much money, you bump up against the, uh, the credit card limit. And the president, in essence, rather than cutting back on spending, making sure you're keeping, uh, you're paying your bills that you already owe, he wants to raise it so the federal government can spend more money. Well, as I mentioned, this $14 trillion in debt boils down to $46,000 for every man, woman, and child in, in the country. So when the president gives a press conference, and I can't remember how many times he mentions uh, charter jets, but he talks about $3 billion in revenue over 10 years, but it's a drop in the bucket dealing with a one-year deficit, or deficit each year, currently this year, $1.5 trillion, or a $14 trillion debt. So the fact of the matter is you cannot get there from here. Even if you did what the president said, it's not serious. It's not honest. It's not candid in terms of what we need to do to get our country back on a solid fiscal pathway. So um, let's talk about federal tax reform. There's been a lot of discussion about that where uh, uh, we want to take the tax code with all of its multiple provisions and get it on the, uh, on the table and take a look at it to make sure it's, in my view, flatter, fairer, and simpler. But right now, Mr. President, the fact of the matter is that according to the Committee of, on Joint Taxation, 51 percent, that's a majority of American households, paid no income tax in 2009. Zero. Zip, nada, no income tax paid by 51 percent of the households in America in 2009. Actually, to show you how out of whack things have gotten, 30 percent of American ta households actually made money from the tax system by way of refundable tax credits, the earned income tax credit, among others. So, 51 percent of Americans households paid no income tax in 2009, but 30% actually made money under the current system. According to the Internal Revenue Service, the top 10% of wage earners in America paid 70% of total income taxes. The top 5% of income earners in America paid nearly 60% of income taxes, and the top 1% pay 38 percent of income taxes. So what is the president talking about and what is the majority leader trying to, what point are they trying to make when they suggest we pass a sense of the Senate resolution saying that millionaires should make a more meaningful contribution to the deficit reduction effort? What are they, what are they, what's, what's their point? Is their point is we ought to raise taxes on people who are already paying taxes? Is their point that people who don't pay taxes, that we should expand the pool of people who do not pay any income tax? Or should we perhaps expand the pool of people who actually benefit from cash transfers, payments, as a result of a, a refundable tax credit? Well, I think it's pretty obvious that we need tax reform. I am skeptical that we have time between now and Secretary Geithner's stated deadline of August the 2nd to do what we need to do and to repair and fix our broken tax system. But I think this helps put in context the, frankly, cynical suggestion that somehow we could solve the problem if we just go after the fat cats and the corporate jet owners if we just make the millionaires and billionaires pay more money, it'll all be all right. Well, I think the American people are smarter than that. And when confronted with the facts, I think they can readily conclude and will readily conclude that the system is broken and needs to be fixed. And we don't need a bunch of smoke and mirrors and phony arguments about class warfare that's not going to solve the problem, and we need to solve the problem. Well, 
Let's look at the, uh, the President's economic record. You know, I know there's been some uh, press reports about uh, the President said we're, we're making a comeback. I think he called uh, this summer the summer of recovery, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but in fact, we know that uh, the President's policies are actually making things worse. All you need to do is look at uh, the number of people who are unemployed in America, 12 million unemployed on uh, Inauguration Day. Now it's almost 14 million, almost 2 million more Americans unemployed. Is that making things better? No, it's making things worse. And we know that there are a lot of people who are taking minimum wage jobs and other jobs not up to their full potential because they want to provide for their families, so we call those underemployed. You'd have, that would make that number even higher. When the President was inaugurated on, uh, uh, in January of 2011, the unemployment rate was 7.8%. 7.8%. Today, it's 9.1%. A seven, that should be a 1.7%, it uh, needs a decimal point there, 1.7% increase. In other words, unemployment is worse today than it was when the President was sworn in. Gas prices, we all know what's happened to gas prices, they've gone through the roof. People are having to deny themselves other discretionary expenditures because they simply have to have the gasoline to be able to drive to work, drive the kids to school, or to take care of their daily business. The fact is, when the President was sworn in, gasoline prices were $1.85. Well, wouldn't it be great if gas prices were $1.85 today? Instead, they averaged $3.58. That's almost a 100% increase in gasoline prices since President Obama put his hand on the Bible and was sworn in as President of the United States. A 94% increase. And then we were talking about the federal debt. Federal debt when the President was sworn in. Some people will tell you, oh, it's all about President Bush and uh, fighting two wars that weren't paid for. It's about the Bush tax cuts and other. Well, I agree there's bipartisan blame when it comes to our national debt. But we ought to link arms and work together to try to solve the problem rather than continue to make it worse. The federal debt when the President Obama was sworn in was $1.6 trillion. Today it's $14.3 trillion, 35% worse. The debt has gone up by 35% since President Obama was sworn in. And I mentioned this factor earlier. This is the, what every American citizen owes in terms of their share of the national debt. When President Obama was sworn in, it was $34,000. Today it's $46,000. So congratulations. Everyone uh, within the sound of my voice owes $11,000 more in the national debt since President Obama became President of the United States. And then there's health insurance. We've had a lot of debate about health insurance costs. They, we were told if we'll just pass this uh, giant health care bill that uh, health insurance costs would go down, uh, that we would fix problems, we'd make sure more people had access to health care. Well, since President Obama became president, health insurance premiums have gone up by 19 percent. 19 percent. Did he make it better or did he make it worse? Well, Mr. President, we need to unburden the economy from higher taxes, excessive regulation, and all the sorts of obstacles that get in the way of small businesses, the primary job creating engine in our economy, from doing what it does best, and that is growing the economy, creating jobs. If our friends across the aisle want more tax revenue, well, the best way to get more revenue is to get more Americans back to work so they, can pay, so they pay taxes rather than be, remain unemployed, losing their home because they can't pay their mortgage. That's how we ought to increase revenue, not by raising rates, not by some of these silly class warfare arguments that seem to target unpopular sectors of the economy. 
And yes, we need to increase exports to create more jobs, and we can do that by ratifying the outstanding trade agreements without adding unnecessary spending to them. And yes, when it comes to uh, energy policy, these high price of gasoline have gone up 94 percent since President Obama became President of the United States. We can open up more domestic energy reserves, more American natural resources, rather than continue to have to import it from places abroad that are not necessarily our friends or which may be in political turmoil or even war like Libya. So if we had a rational national energy policy where uh, the EPA, rather than looking for excuses to deny us access to things like the natural gas uh, discoveries that we have found in Texas and around the country, if we had a way to take advantage of and did in fact take advantage of more domestic energy production, it could help us put Americans, more Americans back to work and help us reduce our dependency on energy from abroad and help bring down this price to one that doesn't break the back of the average working families. Mr. President, I yield the floor and suggest the absence.